So last week I noticed that my interview with Jazzy was beginning to resurface and yesterday I had the time to watch the full two and a half hour conversation between Dr. Cheyenne Bryant and Cam Newton and I had Many thoughts, two in particular that I really felt compelled to share publicly. One is a huge bravo to Dr. Cheyenne Bryant for many reasons. And the second thing I wanted to talk about is how much Mama Newton's frequently referenced relationship axiom got under my skin a bit, so I wanted to offer a reframe. And my mom is an uh, angel, church-going, God-fearing woman. All she knows is my dad. And she says this about relationships. Everybody wants to find a happy ending, right. and they want to find heaven in a person, right? And run off in the sunset. But the reality is nobody wants to find somebody who's worth going to hell for. That's real That's love. Real, real. Worth going to hell for, huh? The realm of eternal suffering, fire, and separation from the divine presence. And hell is like not a place that you go to. It's somewhere that you're sent when you've lived an entire lifetime in opposition of God, or in rare occasions, a place that you're dragged to by a devil. Whee, WWDBD. The point is not to pick at the semantics of the use of the word hell, nor is it to point the finger at anyone's mom and the value system that they uploaded to their very athletic son who then went on to think, hey, people listen to me, so I must be saying helpful stuff. My actual point here is to address the very popular creed that in romantic relationships, it is our partner's duty to be in lockstep with us through our lowest of lows or to endure their lowest of lows because of us. So we'll start with the former point. In 2015, Esther Perel did a TED talk, which I think put into words a frustration that a lot of us were feeling with modern relationships. We still want everything that traditional marriage was meant to provide, security, children, property, responsibility, social status. But now we also want our partner to offer us things that traditional marriage was not meant to provide. So what we once look for in a village or in a community, we now look for in one person. Towards the end of my first pregnancy, my husband and I went on a walk and I said to him, look, if I were pregnant long-term, I would divorce you. He really just couldn't figure out within that time span how to be there for the person that I had become in this really hard, albeit temporary time of my life. But the truth of the matter is, I'm not pregnant all that often. So why would I choose a partner or dismiss a partner based on that criteria? Because in the grand scheme of things, for 80% of this life that we choose to partner on, he is undoubtedly my go-to. And for the other 20%, that is why midwives, counselors, lawyers, medical personnel, clergy members, and probation officers exist. So would it be lovely to fall in love with someone who meaningfully understands how to be with people in their darkest times? Absolutely. But unless your life is a series of managing unimaginable blows, should that be the criteria for what makes for a great partner? And if it is, then pull up the stats, babe. Every trauma specialist should have suitors lined up around the block. And as a matter of fact, I actually know some who genuinely should. And if you think they're spectacular because of how they're there for you in your time of need, oh, wait till you see how marvelous they are when they're in their season of bloom and receptivity. The point I'm trying to make is that Everyone has different strengths, and I think we should choose romantic partners whose strengths complement our norms. And then for everything else, because life is not normal, we have community and we have specialists. And I actually don't think that anyone needs this invitation to spread the burden more than men who statistically in their adult years struggle to make friends, to ask for help, and to connect with people in a way that makes them feel genuinely known. Okay, on to another reframe point here. If you're the kind of person who thinks that an integral component of intimacy is walking through flaming hot poop together for as far as the eye can see, wouldn't you naturally feel less remorseful putting people through hell? Since again, this is an integral component of true love and devotion. And that's like the hazing mentality, right? That in order to get to community, you have to go through immense cruelty. And hazing is what it felt like to watch that interview with Dr. Bryant, because why else would you be so rude to someone that you invited into your home or the castle from Beauty and the Beast, wherever it is that you film your show, unless you thought that pain was a fair exchange for proximity to your value. And if you hold that value system there, well, where else does it show up? Now I admit, I once subscribed to half of Mama Newton's creed because I held the fantasy that me and my romantic partner were meant to be each other's savior in every single storm. But now I've grown to a place of confidence where I can also admit that I'm not that great of a swimmer. So the deal is while we're on this rocky boat, I will hold on to you so tight. But if you fall overboard, then 
I will find the nearest, most capable lifeguard and send them right on in after you. Or actually to give another analogy that's also nautical that Carrie Washington gave to me, a good romantic partner is like a buoy there to save you within their zone of expertise. Like if you have a sexual dysfunction, babe, I got you. But if you drift outside of that zone, then I am here to be your point of reference, to bob and weave so you can see me and find your way back to our normal. And if you drift way, way, way outside of that, well then, yeah, now I have to lengthen my mooring cable and then reestablish my weight. And those things can take some time. So you may have to go on ahead without me and I will try my best to catch up. But the part of that creed that I have never related to is I have never expected anyone to go to hell for me. One, I'm not dragging anybody there, especially not somebody who chooses to love me. And two, yes, I'm snarky and I have flaws, but I'm not going to hell. And I am definitely not keeping intimate company with anybody who's earned their spot. High functioning only means, Cam, that I feel them same feels. I still feel, see my language, you got me fucked up. I'm ready to go there. I'm flamed, I'm triggered. It's all there, right? But it's still doormat. It's still in me. And high functioning means I can regulate those emotions. Watch this and say, okay, right now I'm ready to rip this man's head off. Right now he got me all the way fucked up. Okay, so how do I relay that message to him where it's gonna be respectful, it's gonna be non-combative, and I'm gonna disarm him. While he still knows, you got me fucked up. Because I don't have to say those words for you to know, I think I went too far with Doc. But low functioning people are gonna tear this thing up with no emotional regulation. They're also gonna choose a person who does it with them and allows them to do it. Because I only can do to you what you allow me to do. Because if I start cutting up in here and you say, Doc, we love you, Love to have you here, but you gotta go and you're not welcome back. There's no, no pun intended, that's just not, that's not our culture here. Guess what, I can't do that again. Now I have a choice to make. Do I wanna be in a relationship with Cam? Do I wanna be welcome back here? self inventory you just did me the best favor you could've ever did. By excusing me, you blessed me. Because now I gotta look at myself and say, what needs to be done for me to fit in this?